GST tax efficiently compared to SST. And for this, you will be moderated by Dr. Sri Asman Jan, who is the former chairman of the Malaysian National News Agency, Bernama. And the panelists are three individuals. The first individual of the panelists is Kevin Wu, who is the founder and partner of Kevin Wu and Associates. We also do have Dr. Francesco, who is the senior lecturer of Monash University, Malaysia, as well as Dr. Yong Man Ching, who is the assistant professor of faculty of accountancy and management of University Tunggul Abdul Rahman. Can I please get all of these four individuals up on stage so that we can begin once again the first session of the day, which is our GST tax efficient compared to SST. On behalf of the ISI, let me once again greet warm greetings to all of us here today. Uh, <coughs> since the uh, speakers have been introduced by the, uh, the MC uh, today, our topic, uh, this slight correction, is GST more effective than SST? Uh, GST is a goods and services tax. SST, as we all know, is sales and services tax. To refresh our memory, uh, GST was withdrawn on 1st of June 2018, two weeks after the Pakatan Harapan government came to power. It's just a way of uh, implementing uh, its manifesto, which is to abolish GST. And then one, when uh, Mr. Lim Guan Eng was the finance minister, he came to Bernama and I was still the chairman at that time, I asked him, uh, why did you uh, abolish GST? He said, we won the election primarily due to our promise to abolish GST. So that's uh, it's very, very political as well, no? So uh, let me welcome uh, once again our panel speakers. Uh, we are delighted and honored to have you uh, on this important event and look forward to a great dialogue on this topic. Uh, let us go straight to the first uh, uh, panelist, Mr. Kevin Wu, founder and partner of Kevin Wu and Associates. He's with a, he's a, with a legal uh, background and tax as well. Thank you very much. Please. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin, uh, founder and partner of Kevin Wu Associates, a full service law firm based in KL. Um, the first question is uh, whether GST or SSC, which is more preferable? I'm well aware that there are a lot of uh, people from the tax department offices here and some policy makers here. So um, I think it's a very tricky question to answer that I'm not even sure that experts really know the answer. Uh, because when GST was repealed and uh, SST was reintroduced, we need to bear in mind what's the main Start difference. Question. So do you have your eight oh. minutes of your introduction? Into, no, it's not a question yet, but. Uh, the presentation, eight minutes, sorry, I thought about you were my yeah, presentation. Okay. Each of us will have uh, eight, eight minutes of presentation. It's okay. not, not answering questions. Okay, sorry, yeah. okay. a bit about myself, yes. Um, so yeah, uh, partner uh, at Kemu Associates, a full service law firm based in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my background is I was previously uh, practicing at Screen, uh, one of the largest law firms in Malaysia, primarily in corporate advisory. So my advisory uh, incorporates um, our PNB our sovereign wealth fund, uh, international sovereign wealth funds, advising how to structure the uh, company to become uh, more tax efficient and reduce the liability and exposure to risk when doing business not just in Malaysia but also overseas and setting up the appropriate agreements as well. So I, at Kemu Associates, I practice the, and lead the corporate advisory department and uh, have a litigation team as well, a small uh, criminal defense team as well. Um, so you can uh, find my name, my profile on next week. On the subject of uh, today's panel discussion, is GST more effective than SSD? That's our panel discussion today. I'm sorry, it's not been brief, I think. Yeah. yeah. Is GST more, according to the topic, I'm just referring to the topic, is GST more effective or efficient than SSD? That's the topic for panel discussion yeah. today. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you want me to answer the question? Right, right, right. I was sorry. I apologize. I wasn't uh, brief. So, um, as as I think, uh, right, honourable uh, moderators mentioned, um, 
uh, GSC was introduced in 2015, but shortly had a very short history and was repealed um, and replaced with the SST. Um, just an overall brief introduction. Um, SST is, a, as most of the um, attendees here are familiar, SST is a very narrow base uh, based on specific industries um, uh, depending on uh, what falls within the SST system. Um, it's a it's a single tier tax system, whereas uh, GST is a lot more broad based tax system. And that's a more commonly uh, used system, uh, not just uh, in, 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 in Asia, but also around the world. Uh, for example, in the UK, you've got something called a VAT, a value added tax. So um, I'm sure a lot of you were operating businesses respectively during the time of uh, GST. Uh, when that was first introduced, I can remember a lot of my uh, clients and communities were extremely confused about how this uh, broad-based GST system worked. And obviously when it was implemented, um, there were some issues um, in the community initially, uh, when there was uh, issues like uh, slow tax refunds, uh, complications to the systems, and a lot of new filing forms had to be created. Um, so I think after about uh, six, uh, one or two quarters, about six months in, um, the issues were uh, sort of teethed out and were solved um, over time. So I think that um, the GST was sort of finding its footing and its place um, in the Malaysian uh, tax regime. Um, ultimately, I think it just took some time to, to, for, for businesses and the communities to get used to. Um, yeah, so when SSCs was repealed and replaced, um, I think that um, some people were happy, some were not. I think for a lot of consumers who voted in for a particular government because of the system, maybe perhaps didn't fully understand or comprehend um, how that worked behind the scenes because ultimately the numbers and what, what consumers care about is the cost of living, right? And we don't want to, be, to, to have a multi-tier tax system to increase our cost of living because especially in this time, let's say if the new government was to devise a new tax policy, when cost of living is already increasing so quickly, the last thing we need is another inefficient uh, uh, tax system that, that will increase the cost of a lot of uh, goods and services in our country, which will hinder our um, economic recovery and uh, growth out of, um, out of COVID. So um, for any top tax policy makers out there, I think that um, it's important to get tax revenue from, um, especially through this massive GST SST system, the indirect tax is such a massive contribution. I was looking at some of the statistics yesterday and it's like almost equivalent to our petroleum tax in the country and it's one of our biggest sort of source of income for the, for the government to uh, fund our services in this country. So um, not saying no to, um, to being taxed, but definitely we need to look at the efficiency of the system to ensure that we can generate um, more revenue for the government, but in a fair way that it's for consumers who not, you know, see the price of um, common goods like uh, meat or produce or vegetable increase by 10, 20%. I think over time, um, our government and our tax regime will find the best um, sort of balance between um, between the taxation policies and whether GSASSC works. I think from my latest uh, research, it's, um, I think the government is proposing a new uh, tax regime uh, to, to, to sort of, um, it's more like an adaptation on, and a new kind of um, variation from our SST. So I'm looking forward to reading uh, more about that over the coming months, uh, just waiting for our minister to um, perhaps um, share more. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kevin Wu. Uh, I'd like to quote uh, some words from the Tan Sri uh, Muhammad Sharif, Sharif Kassim, uh, who's former Secretary General of the Treasury or Ministry of Finance. He said, next to death, death and mati, eh, the most fearful is tax. So anyway, I'd like to uh, call on the second speaker, uh, Dr. Francisco Canas, Senior Lecturer from the Monash University of Malaysia. Dr. Canas. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's my great honor to be here, and I also would like to sincerely thank the organizer for this kind invitation. It's for me a privilege to share some ideas uh, uh, before such a distinguished audience and within such a distinguished uh, uh, panel. Okay, just uh, I would like to bring some, uh, uh, let's say, some 
some points, some uh, single points, because we have eight to ten minutes uh, to, to share some ideas. And I would like also to bring some European perspective, because, yeah, uh, as the moderator correctly reminded, I am a senior lecturer here uh, at Monash University, but originally I was educated and practiced both accounting and law uh, back in Europe. So uh, I would like also to bring you some, some uh, European perspective. May we go for the, with the first slide, please? So, the first thing is this, guys. When we think about uh, tax efficiency, the main question, the first question is, what does exactly mean? So when we say we want an efficient tax system, the first point is efficient for who? Of course, ideally, it must be efficient for everyone, because when we think about tax efficiency, usually we refer to businesses. Something is efficient if businesses are happy, but on the other hand, taxes are for fund to fund the government. So of course, we have to find a sort of balance, a sort of equilibrium, which makes everyone happy. And here we go back to one of the, let's say, original questions of the tax system. What are taxes for? What type of tax do we want to implement? Do we want to raise revenue only? Or do we want to steer the behaviors? So are we pursuing fiscal goals or non-fiscal goals? Because we know that it's possible to pursue non-fiscal goals through, uh, through the, the tax system. And also, this is another very general uh, point. Uh, uh, this is something which uh, also I heard in the, in the words of the previous uh, speaker. Please allow me now to wear the hat of the tax lawyer for, for, uh, for just some minutes. 75, 2015, 2018, many reforms. I see that the Malaysian indirect tax system is going through many reforms. We always have to keep in mind that what international investors, especially international investors, want is stability and certainty. So we really need, at a certain point, to do our best to stabilize the system, to find a system which is considered as final and which is flexible enough to adapt to any circumstance, even the most critical one, like the COVID pandemic and so forth. So can we just go to the next slide? Okay, thank you so much. So if we look back at newspapers uh, last year, uh, everyone was pretty much convinced that the Malaysian economy was projected to grow. Okay, everyone was convinced. But this is the same all over the world. Okay, I, I can tell you that that's the same in Europe. If you read last year newspapers, every economist would basically say, yeah, next year we were going to grow. Are we sure that is, this is still true? Because you know, the tax system cannot live in a bubble. Okay? The tax system does not live alone in a bubble. The tax system is something which is heavily influenced by reality, and it's something which the government shall use to influence and to steer the, the reality. So I see two critical points, and something and I'm very happy because this is something which already the the very distinguished director of the tax administration already mentioned. So first, are we sure that the COVID pandemic is over? Because we see that all over the world, contagion are rising again. Okay, for example, if you look at Europe, the, the data from the European countries. Then the second point is the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine is very likely to change all, many of the balances of the equilibrium, sir, of the energy suppliers. For example, I, Malaysia, as a big part of its economy is based on oil, for example. What will happen if in a few months Europe will completely cut the purchase of oil from Russia and Russia will orient its sales toward Asia? Okay, this is something that we have to take into consideration because, as you already said, petroleum tax, GST, SST, something we have to look at the tax system as a whole. Okay? Uh, on this slide, there are also some of the points which, if you go back uh, also in, in, uh, in uh, the scholarly debate, uh, uh, there are some points which were raised uh, in favor of the GST in the past. Uh, I would like to tell you immediately, I'm not that much in favor of the GST, but I will explain you uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes why. Okay? Uh, most of the jurisdiction all over the world have VAT or GST. That's not really a good argument. Okay, that's not a good argument. I know that that's true. But probably something like 170 countries out of 190 have 
VAT or GST, but that's not a good reason to say that's applicable to Malaysia as well. Absolutely not. We know that also, for example, the Gulf countries are implementing GST or VAT similar uh, system. But that's not really a good reason to say that this may happen also in Malaysia, that this should happen also in Malaysia. Uh, and then uh, the director of the Inland Revenue Board had more updated data. Historically, uh, Malaysia has a quite low uh, GDP tax rate. It means that Malaysia levies few taxes in comparison to the OECD countries. But that's also not really a good that's not really a good argument to say how the reality should be. So the fact that Malaysia levies less taxes does not mean that uh, that's a good reason to implement the GST. Okay, so I would like to get rid of these two uh, arguments and remove them from the table. Okay, maybe go to the next slide, thank you. Okay, here we have five points which in theory, in, at least in theory, are in favor of a GST system. They, they are quite, I would say, universal in the sense that when you compare uh, GST with SST, some of the, the conclusions that you may draw are universally accepted. This is a debate, SST versus GST, uh, versus GST, which is more or less the same as the debate that we have between European and American scholars, because you know that America is the biggest country on earth without the VAT. Okay, so at our conferences, we are quite we quite frequently debate about about this. Well, first, as our uh, distinguished uh, panelists also said, of course, GST because it's broader, uh, because it has a broader tax base, is likely to rise more revenue, which is a good argument, of course, especially in this in this post-pandemic uh, period. Then there is the cascading effect, of course. The GST avoids the cascading effects and allows to switch the tax burden entirely on the consumer. Okay? That's, of course, one of the main points. Okay? It also gives a more efficient uh, system with regard to export. Uh, with the GST, it's much easier to have export which, are, which is effectively zero rated. While we know that with drawbacks, of the GST is not always the case. There may be cases in which the export is not, in fact, uh, exempted or uh, zero rated. Then, of course, the GST reduces the risk of transfer pricing because being levied all over the all over the uh, the production chain, it closes the possibility for the businesses to relocate according to uh, transfer pricing uh, studies. And in general, it's considered to be more transparent. Okay? Please allow me also, on this uh, point, I also have to say I, I disagree you know, to a certain extent because of, it's true that it's more transparent than GST. But on the other hand, we all know that when we are consumer, okay, we don't really care about what part of the price, we don't really care about the price structure. What we care about is the final price that we pay. So it's not really, I don't really think that's a good argument. Well, for the first four arguments, I think they are, they are valuable, okay? Uh, maybe we go to the next slide. So this was in general, okay? And then we have the Malaysian specific situation. Here, uh, there are some papers, uh, some academic papers from econ departments of several Malaysian universities, uh, which dates back to 2015, 2016, which I think are still very useful and nowadays, there are also three further arguments in support of the GST, which are specific to the Malaysian uh, situation. The first is the informal sector. We know that Malaysia is a quite large informal sector, and of course, many of these people who are active in this sector do not pay direct taxes, and therefore a broad-based consumption tax may help the government to raise uh, more funds and to bring a sort of equilibrium of, uh, of, uh, of balance. Then we have the fact that thousands of people work in Singapore and consume in Malaysia. These are people who go either weekly or daily uh, to Singapore. So this, uh, in theory, a broad-based GST is a good way to transfer. Let me, I know that from an economic standpoint that's not accurate, but let me put it in this way. It's a good way to transfer funds from the Singaporean economy to, Mal to the Malaysian treasury. And then, of course, we are waiting for millions of tourists, hopefully in the next year, in the next years. So 
all these tourists are going to consume here. So that's a very good reason. Another point that I would like also to ask with specific regard to the, uh, to the Malaysian system is that the objection against the GST is that GST is regressive, which is true. But how do you balance the regressivity of GST with personal income taxation, which is scaled? And the Malaysian income taxation is very scaled. It's, it has more than 10 rates. It's probably one of the most scaled in the world. So I think that the Malaysian system is ready, is, is ready to receive uh, a GST. Uh, maybe just go to the next slide, if you allow me just one minute more um, on this, on this uh, slide. I think it's a very important slide. Uh, so the, if you ask me, is uh, the GST better in absolute? My answer is absolutely not. I come from a country, from a continent where the, the VAT is already decades old. I can tell you that there are big uh, there are big issues, and uh, I would like to bring these three points. These three points were elaborated by Professor Joachim English, who is one of the most prominent experts in Europe on, uh, on VAT. He is theorizing uh, a hybrid system. So he basically is advocating for a hybrid system, a system which, is, which puts together some elements of SSD and some element of the GST, because also a pure VAT GST system has many issues. First, First point, deduction, okay? Of course, businesses love to deduct the input tax, but on the other hand, we have also to bear in mind that virtually every fraud within the GST VAT is based on the deduction mechanism. Every single fraud, then you have more complex fraud like the carousel fraud, which are possible only in Europe, or easier, uh, easier less complex frauds, like, for example, forged certificates. But in the very moment in which you implement a GST system, you have also to implement strict controls. And this is expensive. This is really expensive. So you have to ascertain whether it's really worth to do that. First point. Second, it's more exposed to revenue loss, especially in a time of crisis, like this one, okay? So what happens if, for example, a business purchases many, many goods and then is not able to retail, to sell them? Okay? This triggers GST effects. You have to refund. You have to refund. You have to manage the refunds. And the, the treasury earns zero out of that. Okay? So if we expect, for example, many companies to bankrupt in the next few years, so it may be an option to wait some months before implementing a GST because it's really going to, to be a cost. And then finally, last but not least, the neutrality. Okay? Uh, this is very much from a Euro and with this enclosed, uh, it's very much from a European perspective. In Europe, the rate is very high because the rates of VAT are 20, 23, 25%, so it's quite a lot. This has a strong financial impact on the whole production chain. Because, of course, even if you get the refund, but it's not immediate, okay? You have to, to pay and then wait uh, for, for this uh, amount of money to come back in a certain way. So, the point is, in this, uh, are we sure that in this moment where we are trying to relaunch the economy, uh, our economy after the pandemic, is it really the right moment to implement such an expensive tax? Because GST is going to be an, ex an expensive tax. Okay, I thank you very much for, for this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanetz. Uh, now may I invite uh, our third panelist, Dr. Wong Man Ching, who is an assistant professor, faculty of accountancy and management at the University a very good morning to you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as you know, I initially I came from an auditing background, PwC Malaysia, and I spent some years in New York doing financial due diligence. Then thereafter, I joined the corporate world, and finally, now I'm in the academic world. So, academic world has brought a different perspective. Uh, to what I have learned so far, but I think it's also very good because because of my background in the corporate world, I'm able to understand business taxpayers compliance issues and compliance challenges. So when I'm speaking to you, I'm also speaking as a voice for the business taxpayers in Malaysia. Okay, so let me start. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to start with the presentation. So basically, there are four main areas of my presentation, and. Uh, 
we, we first start with the overview of the federal government revenue, okay, from 2007 to 2022. Next slide, please. I believe um, it is very important for us to understand the perspective of the composition of the federal government revenue over a period of time because many people think that GST is going to solve all your issues, all the critical budget deficit that you have in the country for the past 50 years. So this is just an overview for you to understand that, uh, for all of us to understand that uh, in terms of the Okay, sorry, technical issue. So in terms of the composition of the federal government revenue, from 2007 until uh, estimate 2022, right, there have been a focus on uh, personal income tax as well as corporate tax. And uh, that is because of the shift of uh, government towards uh, taxing more from corporate as well as from personal taxpayers. And as far as the indirect tax, uh, the percentage is very low. It's generally less than 20% in all of the years, except during the period when GST was implemented in 2015. We have 24.5. 20, 2016 is a full year. We, ha we have um, uh, GST, um, we have indirect taxes are increasing to about 28% of the total tax revenue. So after the implementation of uh, SST 2.0, it has gone down again to about 18 to 19 percent. Okay, so that is the local context. And then, uh, next slide, please. So, as you know, the initial introduction of GST was meant to collect more tax from the shadow economy and to re reduce reliance on oil revenue. So, this is the trend from 2014 to 2022. So, as you can see here, SST 2.0 when compared to GST, in terms of the number wise, you can see that there's a big gap. Okay? And uh, for the next few years from 2019 until 2022, it's rather flat around 27, 28 billion. Okay? Next slide, please. So, so I am speaking of the comparison between SST 2.0 and uh, GSD from the perspective of uh, taxpayers based on my research. Um, okay, so one key point is uh, we want to look at uh, the scope of taxation and tax neutrality. Tax neutrality is a concept uh, whereby we look at the fairness of tax where everybody pays a fair portion of tax. Generally speaking, uh, our speakers have mentioned that uh, GST is more broad-based and this is evidenced by the fact that there are 472,000 business taxpayers in Malaysia who are responsible to collect tax for the government in comparison to SST registered taxpayers which are also um, we are, which are only 100,000 so we, we are only having 25% of the business taxpayers who are involved in tax collection which means the burden to collect tax is solely dependent on 100,000 business taxpayers. And in terms of the goods subjected to tax, for SST, it is only applicable to 38% of the consumer price index basket in comparison to 60% of the tax, 60% uh, of the goods which are subjected to GST. This means that more, um, more products are subject to GST and there is a um, there is a tax neutrality where everybody, more people are paying tax for the purpose of our government's coffer. Next, uh, next, next, please. Next slide, please. Next one, okay. So, based on my qualitative interviews that I have done with the business taxpayers in Malaysia for both uh, SMEs and as well as the large companies, I, I, I found that um, generally SMEs, they find that complying with SST is a much simpler system. However, they have to suffer from increase in operational costs. The increase in operational costs, which also means that they have to bear more tax burden and their costs have gone up and 
most of them have no choice but to transfer the increased cost to the consumers uh, and also businesses in Malaysia. So to what extent SST can really reduce the cost of living? That is a $1 billion question. Okay? So because someone has to bear the cost. The problem with SST is there are many cascading effects of tax which can be can be uh, passed on to the various value chain and you may not be able to see how much is the element of cost. So transparency is an issue. And uh, finally, one major issue that we have in relation to GST is that most of the businesses that I have interviewed, they have suffered consid considerably from the delay in uh, GST refund from Royal Malaysian Customs Malaysia. Okay? But having said that, towards the end of the GST introduction, government has already uh, has already increased the speed of refund and uh, that has truly helped the um, Malaysian businesses in transitioning to the new system. Okay, But uh, one important thing is that uh, because of so many exemptions of products under the SSC system in order to mitigate the um, increased cost of operation of businesses, the list of exemption as you can see there, okay, in terms of SSD, there are 6,400 items being exempted. Uh, the list of exemptions have actually increased the tax complexity in terms of complying with SST. And that is another issue that they raised. Okay? So next slide, please. And uh, I have a very interesting finding in relation to business taxpayers' perspective towards GST compliance. When I interview them, I, I would expect them to complain about GST because that was the, the version of the story that, that we have been hearing in the public. GST is bad, GST compliance is so expensive. But when I talk to them, many of them are in support of GST. So there are a few, uh, four areas of uh, perceived managerial benefits from complying with GST. The first one, they mentioned that they are ta the financial result of the companies have actually improved as a result of GST. Okay? And the business operation and effectiveness and effectiveness and efficiency have also improved because of GST. And tightening of internal control have improved because of implementation of GST. And finally, record keeping of businesses have have started, uh, especially among the SMEs, for some of them, record keeping is not of a high priority because it involves a lot of resources. But because of GST and because of the requirement, their improvement in record keeping is uh, impressive. So that is one of the key takeaways that I obtain when I interview SMEs as well as large businesses. Uh, next, please. So to to give you a glimpse of what they say about uh, timely reporting of financial results, the first one is one person mentioned that we became more disciplined with the GST. It helped us to become more disciplined. And that is what an owner uh, of SME told me. He is very happy with GST. And uh, he also mentioned that uh, thanks to Royal Malaysian Custom, we are forced to be more disciplined. Okay? And uh, there's another snapshot. Another such shot about the efficiency and effectiveness in business. So this person mentioned that in terms of invoicing customer, it is on time now. So the discipline is there and suppliers also invoice invoices on time. The business become more efficient. Okay, so next. And uh, we want to touch on this uh, sensitive uh, area. In fact, not really sensitive. A few more minutes, sorry. Uh, GST is important to reduce the, the size of the shadow economy. Based on my research that I have done in 2018, I, I have evidence to demonstrate that uh, shadow economies have actually reduced as a result of GST implementation. And with the reduction of shadow economy, there will be higher tax revenue for the government of Malaysia because uh, the shadow economy and the businesses will surface out of nowhere in order to claim input tax and as a result the overall direct tax collection from personal income tax and corporate tax will also increase as a spillover from GST implementation. To give you an indication, uh, shadow economy 
is about 21% of the GDP of Malaysia between 2010 and 2019. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is one evidence from uh, my interviewee. She mentioned that uh, uh, businesses owned by Indonesians in Chalkit market have closed down as a result of GST implementation way back in 2015. And for her, she is grateful and she's happy that uh, this thing is happening because the business owners who are doing business legally, now they are protected from the onslaught and unfair competition imposed by the shadow economy. Next slide, please. So we have been talking about the uh, tax to GDP. And now we move on to show you a slide that uh, Malaysia tax to GDP was 2018 in 2019, and it is the third lowest after Indonesia and Laos. So our tax collection is really low. Okay, then next slide please. And here is showing you that in terms of personal income tax and consumption tax for Malaysia, we are also under collected comparatively with the upper middle income, income countries. If you look at the personal tax, we are second lowest. Okay, only 2.2% of GDP came from personal tax. And uh, the more interesting part is consumption tax collection as a percentage of GDP. Malaysia is uh, second lowest comparatively, only 2.5% in comparison to all our neighboring countries which are poorer. And uh, the average of uh, upper middle income, in middle income countries is about 7.5% of GDP. We are only 2.5%, which means there's ample space for us to collect more from consumption tax. Next slide, please. So finally, my conclusion is that um, it is time for GST. The timing, I leave it to the politician uh, to handle this. And I just want to mention that uh, Malaysia is not alone in repealing the GST. Um, there are five other countries that have done so. Grenada, Malta, Vietnam, Ghana and Belize. They have repealed and later they reintroduced GST in their tax system. And Malaysia is also similar to the situation in Malta, whereby the politicians promised to repeal the system if they were elected in power. So, seems like those who have repealed GST, they have made a U-turn, and it is my hope that uh, we will go back to GST. I think it's a much fairer tax, more transparent tax, where everyone should pay tax, okay? When you consume, you should pay. Thank you, Dr. Yong. Uh, in fact, the government is thinking about reintroducing GST. I think with so many side good side effects that you mentioned, I think they will be uh, reinstated. Uh, I, will, I will have one question each for our panelists before I open questions to the floor. Uh, Mr. Kevin Wu, uh, it's reported that only about 10% of the working population in Malaysia are paying tax. Why as compared to across the causeway in Singapore, almost every work worker Pay tax. So this, as Dr. Yong mentioned, one of the lowest or lowest. Uh, how do you propose that we can increase this from 10 percent of only 10 percent working population paying tax? Can it be increased? In what way? Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Dr. Yong, for sharing a lot of the uh, unique uh, statistics and uh, introducing the, uh, the the sort of stats to the floor. Um, well, it's a good and bad thing, right? Uh, the good thing is that we have a lot of room to improve. So when we start from one, the second lowest means that there's a lot of opportunities for us to, for the government to collect more tax. But albeit, um, I know there are some businessmen in here, um, not just talking about like how to increase tax for government, but it needs to be fair for the businesses and sustainable for the businesses as well. Because ultimately, tax is not, you know, the consumers and businesses are not just a piggy bank for the government, right? We need to obviously balance that out so businesses can have more retained earnings for future uh, investment and growth. So um, just want to tone it down a bit. It's not just about uh, collecting, collecting, collecting. Um, but I think that it's a sort of a good dilemma to be in right now in, uh, in Malaysia. Um, I think this conference is really about SST and GST, but obviously when we look at tax, we need to look at it from an overall perspective. 
um, biggest contribution is um, corporate taxes. All the big companies, the big names that come here, the, the Petronases, the Sam Darby's, uh, those are massive contributors to our economy. When all prices go up or down, that sort of determines how much tax revenue we'll have that year. For example, palm oil prices um, during the COVID pandemic uh, skyrocketed. So that would have an impact on um, on, on our, our collections at the end of the year. So we're very, very still dependent on a, a few uh, core industries in our economy. Let's uh, not forget about the, the corporates that are contributing so much to the economy, the personal income taxes that each and every one of us in this room are contributing to, although that's tiered um, in, a, in a way. Uh, that, that is a bit more straightforward for the government to sort of um, collect because it's based on your um, salary, it's based on your EPF contributions. I think that's not too much we can do there. Um, uh, I, and going back to this GST and SST, is it more efficient? I am of the view that uh, GST and consumers, I've spoken to a lot of my uh, clients who have um, tax queries, and actually a lot of us don't mind paying a bit more taxes enough, if, as long as it's fair. And the government can really um, collect the taxes and invest in the right um, things, like the right infrastructure, and be accountable to the tax. So that means when the government invests our tax money into the right things, like new schools, new bridges, new roads, new highways, new uh, public transport system, that money will eventually come back to our economy, and then we would um, will eventually come back to the economy, and then we would see growth. That means that your revenues, our revenues as businesses, or uh, as potentially employees would increase over time as well. We want to see that. We don't want to be in a spiral where, where we're paying more taxes, but revenue is not increasing, everything's stagnant, or yeah. even, in fact, uh, cost of living is going up, but salaries are stagnant. Then, of course, if the government's trying to implement more tax, the general population uh, would not be so cooperative or agreeable to vote in that government that wants to increase taxes. So I think a lot of it comes to trust. Um, the government can build that trust. Thank yeah. you very much, yeah. Dr. Wu. Um, Mr. Kevin Wu, sorry. Uh, question for Dr. Ken Kenes. If the government wants to reinstate the GST to replace it with the present, to replace the present SST, you mentioned again, what should it do to gratify the public? You know, it's a political question today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this question. I think it's a very stimulating one. It's a bit more of a political uh, question in a certain way. Uh, let me tell you a little story about that. Uh, in the 90s, in the late 90s, Italy at a certain point had nice his uh, tax system. Basically, he abol it abolished five local taxes and they replaced it with one single tax, which is a surcharge on the corporation tax, okay? Businesses do not like this uh, tax at all because it has a very limited possibility for production. Okay, so basically put it on, uh, on, the, on the balance sheet. This tax was explicitly linked to the healthcare system. So basically it was said the revenue of this tax uh, go to the healthcare and we fund entirely healthcare through this tax. Well, I tell you, there was a very strong debate uh, at that time. Now, after almost 30 years, I can tell you that this tax is the last disputed of poll tax. Because people like it. Uh, oh, well, of course, I'm not uh, a bit exaggerating. People want to pay it uh, and do not criticize it because they know that when they go to hospital, they are treated thanks to this tax. So my, I, my idea would be, if you want to increase taxes, Anyway, it's often enough to explain to the citizens and to the taxpayer what exactly you are funding with that. So you must be able, I think the government should be able to tell to the taxpayers, okay, we will let you a higher tax, but with that tax we will find this project. So the people must be able to see how this tax is changing their life in a positive way. Okay, I think okay. that's the, the solution. The last question um, to Dr. Young. What would happen to Malaysia if the government continues to implement the SST system? Actually, just a short one. Yeah, actually my slides have already uh, highlighted uh, the key points. What will happen if SST continues? 
So I just want to say that uh, if we continue to, to be in this situation, uh, our government's uh, sustainable tax collection will be will be affected because uh, the IRB now is focusing on taxing from the shadow economy. How do we do it? They are everywhere and they are nowhere. So GST is is a solution because GST has very long audit trail and you can trace the transaction, the flows of transaction from one company to another company. It's very difficult for shadow economy to hide their transaction. And uh, my, my recent interview with a logistic company told me that, uh, you know, with, uh, with GSD, he has a lot more new business taxpayers. Now that SSD has happened, he has a lost a lot of businesses because now they're going back to the shadow economy. With that, I think we should go back to GSD. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Perhaps we have one, one two questions from the floor. Uh, we have how many minutes we have? 10 minutes? Yeah, you have 10 minutes. Okay. A uh, few questions from the floor, please. Q&A time. Of course, I know tax is a very technical method, but over you are tax people, I think. <laughs> A very taxing session. <laughs> Any question uh, before we end the session? Uh, I think all are satisfied. No, no. You don't add anything? Okay, uh, let us give a big hand to all our speakers. Up. Please, yeah. The question from uh, our gentleman here. My under GST, tax are paid by the supplier <coughs> as a supplier. I'm asking is that the ultimate consumer, like uh, buying goods uh, for domestic use, would they be paying much higher prices because the, from stage to stage, the prices are increasing? And they have no chance of getting refund for the price they pay. So your question to me? Yeah. Uh, my, yeah, my impression is, uh, I can only give you, of course, a, a first impression. Yes, the price will be high, definitely. The price will high, will, and the, in fact, it's very interesting because we are I agree on everything with my uh, learned colleagues, but uh, I'm not saying that GST is not a good solution. I'm just wondering whether it's the right solution in this very historical moment. Okay, because of course we, I mean, I, I think that we all expect prices to go, to still go up also during the next year. For sure, GST will uh, will uh, will uh, will increase prices further, and that's why we have to explain to the people why. We, 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 we go for that solution, if we decide to go for that solution. Uh, I think it's okay if I jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah, we all have very different views on this panel, which makes it interesting, right? Because it's very theoretical, GST may collect more, but could, could historically did collect more tax, so what if we implement, would that be a better system? It's very theoretical. So what consumers are caught, GST is paid by the end consumer, you know, ultimately you can claim, 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 and then ultimately consumers pay. But I think that it really depends on the economics of the business. Because, for example, where I grew up in the UK, uh, VAT at the time was about 20%. And ultimately, you know, I think there's margins along the supply chain that people are willing to adjust to, to cater to that. So even if we implement GST, it uh, may not necessarily mean higher prices because um, suppliers or retailers still want to do the business. They still want consumers to keep buying from them. So maybe um, margins may be reduced along the supply chain. So this is all theoretical, but it really depends on the industry, whether you're buying chicken or BMW. Um, it really, really depends. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think uh, no other question. Uh, yeah, one last question for uh, the session before we start the second session. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Uh, my question is about, <clears throat> uh, in your opinion, if we, if the government decide to implement the GST, should what kind, what rate should it be 
in this new because so last time we, six we, had, we had last time we had six percent. Yeah. Uh, and then and in this new GST, what did uh, the government should uh, uh, start the the GST? And my second question is, uh, last time we have this list, uh, certain goods are not taxable under GST or zero rated. Should we maintain that list or should we implement a new rate, a different rate? For example, in Japan, they have this consumption tax whereby uh, items, uh, goods related to the food or necessary which we use in our daily life have a lower rate compared with uh, items like uh, electronics. Electronic stuff, they have 10% of uh, consumption tax. Whereby for the food, uh, like uh, fish, uh, rice, they have like, I, if I remember correctly, about 6 or 6%. I'm, uh, if I'm so your question is at what rate? Huh? Yes, what rate? From 6% previously. Or what rate or whether it's increased or not, that is my first question. My second question is, should we have a, a different rate between uh, the uh, uh, goods that is related to our daily life, the example for food is different rate, and for the item that is been considered not as we use in normal life, like for example, uh, probably uh, electronic items should have a different rate. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yong would like to answer. Actually, 6% GST rate is one of the lowest in the world for your information. But uh, if you introduce less than 6%, then when you compare against the cost of uh, compliance in terms of administration of the tax, right, the government would roughly be brick. Anything less than uh, less than 6%, the cost of compliance is much more than the revenue being taken. So that was the rationale being, uh, being, being used for 6%. But however, having said that, given that uh, the prices are increasing and there's a lot of pressures to contain the price. Perhaps we can start at the lower rate at 3% as what has been done by the Singapore government so that uh, the public will be, will, you know, will, be, will be more at ease with GST implementation at a minimal rate and then you can increase it gradually over, uh, over time as what has been done by the Singapore government. 3% Singapore. Yeah, yeah. So, the second thing is uh, you're talking about um, using various strategies for different different rate for different type of uh, products, and um, actually the more rate that you use, right, the more complex it will be, and the more you will be subject to abuses by the businesses or by the businesses. So it is it, it is better to use a flat rate or maybe special exemption. For in, in the case of uh, GST, uh, there are already 12,000 items being exempted from GST because they are considered essential goods and services. So then we have another, if you're going to add in the multiple level or rate, right, I think it's going to be very complex in terms of the administration. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we end the session. Thank you very much to our panelists, uh, Mr. Kevin Wu, Dr. Francisco Kenneth, and Dr. Yong Man Ching. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you for the Of course, I'd like to also thank Dr. Kui and Asman Jian right here. So, panelists and moderator, please remain on stage because right now we'd like to give you guys a small talk of appreciation for coming up and sharing with us your opinions. And for this, I'd like to invite up on stage Dr. Sri Samson Baring Bin Mohan Jamil to present this talk of appreciation over to the panelists as well as the moderators.
Group. Right, thank you so much.